Hi, uh, my name is Tom Richardson. I'm a uh, urologist here at the Physicians Clinic of Iowa in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And today I'm going to spend some time uh, reviewing some of the signs and symptoms of BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia, and then specifically talk about some treatment options uh, focusing on the uh, Urolift procedure. So first thing is that people wanna know is what is BPH? Well, BPH stands for benign prostatic hyperplasia. Uh, and that is a non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate, and uh, it's not any indication of prostate cancer. Um, it can be associated with a PSA that may be elevated, and it'll be important for uh, your physician, either your primary care physician or your primary care provider or your urologist to do a rectal examination and differentiate between those two. But the uh, term BPH simply stands for a benign enlargement of the prostate gland and the symptoms that subsequently occur because of that. As you can see here, uh, BPH and the symptoms associated with that uh, increases as men age. Starting at the age of 50, there's about a 60% incidence, uh, and this goes up by approximately 10% per, with each decade of life. So just quickly, we'll talk a little bit about the anatomy of the prostate. As you can see here, the uh, bladder, which stores urine, uh, drains through the urethra, and the urethra travels through or is surrounded by a gland called the prostate. And this is typically a walnut-sized gland, and it really serves a reproductive function in that it produces fluid that helps to transport sperm during the reproductive ages. And after that, it really doesn't serve much purpose other than to cause problems as it potentially uh, be becomes larger in size. And uh, the other uh, obvious issue with uh, the prostate is the uh, risk of prostate cancer as men age. So this, this diagram here really shows us on the, on the left side, you see the bladder and the prostate and the relationship between the two. And um, typically uh, as the prostate begins to be increase in size, it can produce or exert some pressure on the urethra and create obstructions such that the bladder, which is a muscle, has to begin generating more pressure and has to, uh, for lack of a better term, work harder to achieve uh, an, an, an empty bladder. And when that happens, there can be changes in the lining of the bladder and the bladder muscle that leads to some of the symptoms that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So how do we recognize the symptoms of BPH? Well, uh, oftentimes when you come to see us in the office, we're gonna have you uh, complete a survey called the International Prostate Symptom Score. And it essentially asks you these questions and has, and has the patient give a numerical score from one to five for each one of those. But some of the typical symptoms, as you will see here, is urinary frequency, uh, particularly associated with an urge to urinate that may or may not be something that the patient can control and may result in some urinary leakage that's without warning or something that can't be, uh, can't be suppressed. Um, some of the other symptoms of BPH would include a stream which is weak or slow, uh, a feeling of incomplete bladder emptying and potentially the need to wait for the urinary stream to start or to have uh, some post void dribbling at the end of the stream. So those are some basic symptoms. Obviously there are other more um, specific symptoms that we often will discuss as well, but these are kind of the general symptoms that we worry about in men who are suffering from symptoms related to BPH. And I think it's important to emphasize that just because a patient has BPH, they don't necessarily have the symptoms of it, but these are some of the symptoms that occur when the prostate becomes larger and creates obstruction. So obviously quality of life becomes a big issue with men who have BPH, and we find that a lot of men will start to alter their lifestyle because of their symptoms. Uh, many of them state they're sleepy during the day because they're up many times at night to urinate. Many of them will avoid certain activities or plan their activities around where they know a bathroom is located because they don't want to get into a situation where they're far from a bathroom and may have the risk of having a urinary accident. Um, a lot of men will, will change leisure activities such as um, golfing, going to sporting events, et cetera, for fear that they might have a problem. And many men will begin using a bathroom stall instead of a urinal because of some of the embarrassment associated with the feeling that they stand there for long periods of time while others around them uh, come and go. So this is a nice slide that shows us on the far left is a healthy bladder. The bladder is a muscular sphere that's covered with 
a very healthy looking pale pink mucosa. And as the bladder muscle begins to work harder, you can see that some of those muscle spindles or muscle fibers start to show through that wall of the bladder. In the middle, that's some moderate, what we call trabeculation on the far right. That's severe trabeculation with even some areas where there's form formation of something called a diverticula diverticulum or a cellule where mucosa sort of, sort of bulges through the uh, through the, the, the hypertrophied fibers of the bladder wall. And this is something that we definitely look at when we perform an endoscopic evaluation or a cystoscopy for patients who were evaluating for bladder outlet obstruction. Um, as I said, uh, how, how is it diagnosed? By a medical history, obviously thorough history, and then also having the patient complete what's called an IPSS or an International Prostate Symptom Score. And then we also uh, assess some quality of life issues to find out how much it bothers the patient. Obviously, if, if, if we're concerned that someone is having symptoms related to BPH, there's a, a, a basic examination that would be completed at the time of the first evaluation, which would include a, a, a rectal examination to assess the size of the prostate, um, assess a urinalysis, and, uh, and more than likely a PSA blood test based upon the patient's age. And then more uh, diagnostic testing can be uh, performed, which includes a, a uroflow test, which can determine a patient's urine flow rate and compare that to what is normal. Uh, some bladder pressure studies to determine how much pressure the bladder is having to generate to achieve a flow. Uh, a cystoscopy, which uh, can visualize the prostatic urethra and determine if there are changes in the, in the bladder wall that are indicative of a problem and potentially an ultrasound to either determine the size of the prostate or to perform a biopsy if we're, uh, if we're feeling the need to rule out the possibility of prostate cancer. So the treatment options for BPH and the symptoms that go along with that are, are, are variable and along the continuum. In some men, they have some mild symptoms. They're not particularly bothered by them. We may just simply watch those patients, but make sure that we're seeing them back because we know these symptoms can progress and we don't want to miss the window of opportunity to, to uh, treat and correct the problem. Medications can be prescribed. Primarily, that's a medication that's an alpha blocker that causes muscle relaxation around the bladder neck and the prostate or potentially a medicine that will uh, prevent the conversion of one testosterone to another and uh, and and shrink the size of the prostate over time. On the other end of the spectrum are more invasive treatments. Um, the gold standard for many years was a transurethral surgery uh, to uh, essentially um, shave out a large uh, portion of that glandular enlargement to create a wider passageway, but obviously this is a surgical procedure, requires an anesthetic, a hospital stay, and recovery. Uh, more recently, there are newer procedures, laser procedures, water vapor therapies, and right in the middle is, uh, is the Urolift procedure. And the Urolift procedure is a minimally invasive um, treatment uh, that can be typically done in an office-based setting with a, a short period of recovery and very good long-term results with minimal side effects. This is a nice picture here that shows how the Urolift system works. On the far left, you have an enlarged prostate that's squeezing the outlet, causing obstruction. And then this shows the cystoscope in place where uh, a delivery device is used to essentially place uh, these Urolift uh, tabs into the prostatic urethra, which essentially pulls the prostatic urethra open, creating a wider passageway for urine to flow. And this picture here shows placing four devices, but uh, occasionally we can, we can implant up to six and, and perhaps even seven in some circumstances, depending upon each patient's anatomy. This is a nice picture that shows the size of the, uh, the permanent Urolift implant. Uh, the nitinol capsular tab is delivered through a needle through the prostate and it anchors itself to the outside capsule of the prostate. And then the device is used to uh, tension the device and then place the urethral end piece, which is what creates the tension to pull the urethra open and results in a wider passageway. A good example here, the picture on the left shows uh, the patient's prostate uh, near the uh, distal part of the prostatic urethra before, before it becomes the external sphincter. And you can see the lateral lobes are co-apting or kind of kissing in the middle and creating very little passageway for urine to flow. And on the right side, this is a picture after treatment when the urolift tabs have been placed and pulled open the curtains, if you will, and created a wide, wider passageway for urine to flow. 
And one thing that I think we as urologists have learned and patients are starting to understand is it doesn't take um, a very wide passageway for someone's flow to improve dramatically and their symptoms to improve significantly. So that's kind of a brief overview of what is BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia, essentially uh, prostatic enlargement that may um, cause uh, obstruction and the resultant symptoms that go along with that. Um, the next step would be to take the IPSS survey, determine what your symptom score is. And if you feel like your symptoms have gotten to the point where they're bothersome and they're affecting your quality of life, or you want to no longer take a medication that you might be taking, the next step would be to uh, seek out uh, an appointment with your primary care provider or a urologist for a more thorough and detailed evaluation. Once again, uh, just wanna thank you for your time. Uh, hope this has been helpful in, in educating you a bit about uh, BPH and uh, Urolift as a treatment option. Thank you.